Chapter 10. Night in the Park. The streets around Madison Square Garden were quiet. But as soon as Jim stepped outside, a crowd of around 50 men closed in around him and Joe. They were very different from the crowd that had waited after the Griffiths fight years ago. These men looked tired and hungry. But when they saw Jim Braddock, hope lit up their faces and they stood taller. Just sign your name for a few, said Joe with a smile. Leave them wanting more. No, Joe. Tonight I sign them all. Jim moved among the crowd, shaking hands and signing his name and talking for over an hour. Joe did most of the talking on the drive to New Jersey. When they reached the apartment building, Jim opened the door. Good night, Joe. Haven't you forgotten something? Asked Joe. He reached into his coat for Jim's share of the prize money. He began to explain how he had decided on the amount. I trust you, Joe, said Jim. And may trust you, too. Joe pushed the money into the fighter's hand and waved good night. When Jim entered the little apartment, he put some of the cash in the jar on the shelf. He put the rest in a white envelope. Jim didn't sleep much that night. And he left the apartment before May and the children woke up. The sidewalks were empty as he walked to the center of town. He joined the line inside the relief office and waited patiently. Finally, he stepped up to the counter and nodded at the woman. He gave her the white envelope. The woman was confused when she looked at the cash. So, you're giving us the money back? On the way home, Jim bought 12 roses for May. They were very expensive, but he wanted to apologize for not waking her to tell her about the Lasky fight. He hadn't wanted to celebrate until he had paid back the money to the relief office. But when he got home, it wasn't the time for celebrating. Mike Wilson's wife, Sarah, was sitting on the sofa with her baby girl in her arms. Her eyes were red from crying. Mike's gone, said May seriously. It's been three days now. About a week after you left the docks, Jim. The foreman stopped picking him for work, cried Sarah. I went to stay with my brother. There wasn't room for Mike. So he's been sleeping in Central Park. Sarah looked straight at Jim. He said he was going to do some work for you. We were going to meet last night, but Mike never came. Silently, May pointed at the jar that contained their money. Jim nodded. Listen, Sarah, you and May go and get something for the baby's cough. But Sarah was crying. Something's wrong. I know it is. Jim moved toward the front door. I'll go and find him. Hours later, Jim entered Central Park. As the sun sank, he knew that the enormous park wasn't as empty as it looked. Since the crash of 1929, tens of thousands of New Yorkers were living in cars, or on the streets, or in the subway. A lot of people had started living in Central Park. Some of them built huts or tents from any materials they could find. Others slept wherever they could. They ate any food they could find or catch or steal. Jim had heard that there had been a lot of sheep in Central Park. Most had been moved away. Now, as he searched for Mike, Jim saw park workers guiding the last sheep into enormous wagons. Jim watched until a policeman on a horse waved at him to move away. The shadows became longer as night came. And soon trash can fires were the only lights in the park. Jim went deeper into the park, past huts and tents. The sound of wet coughs filled the air. Mike. Mike Wilson? He called. Suddenly, two running policemen shouted at him to get out of the way. He looked to see where they were going. And saw a crowd of people around several policemen on horses. Jim heard angry shouts and saw flames. He ran to the crowd and had to push his way through a wall of people to reach the center. A group of men had fought the police here, turning one of the sheep wagons over and burning huts. The police were in control again and were guiding the men away like sheep. There were two policemen on horses near Jim. We were just trying to move the sheep, one of them told the other. But one of these guys started shouting at us. He was angry, very political. Then they attacked us. Jim closed his eyes and remembered all Mike's angry talk. He knew this must be Mike. He began looking for his friend among all the fallen men on the grass. He got closer to the wagon that lay on its side. A guy tried to free the sheep, a policeman was saying. The horses were scared and the wagon turned over. There was someone with his legs under the enormous wheels of the wagon. A group of men lifted the wagon up. And that's when Jim realized that there was a second man under the wagon, lying in a pool of blood. It was Mike. Jim's friend wasn't dead yet. Jim moved the hair from Mike's eyes. Did you win? Mike asked. 
His voice was soft and filled with pain. Jim nodded. You're going to be okay, Mike, he said. Mike managed a weak nod. I know it. But, in the cold and dark of New York's Central Park, as the smoke from the burning huts blew over them, and took away the last of the light, both men knew that this wasn't true. Few people came to Mike's funeral. It was a work day and most people couldn't afford to lose a day's money. Only Jim and Mae Braddock and their three children stood with Sarah Wilson and her baby daughter as Mike's body was put into the ground. Jim spoke of Mike's love for his family, his wife. He didn't say what he felt that Mike's death was a waste. A stupid, unnecessary waste. Jim understood why people got angry. But Mike's anger hadn't helped his wife or his daughter. Jim wished he had known how bad things had become for his friend. He couldn't forget how kind Mike had been to him when he started working at the docks. May's attention was on Sarah, whose eyes were far away. She seemed to be staring into the long future that waited for her without her husband. As she looked at Sarah, part of May wondered if she was looking into a mirror of her own future. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but one day she might lose Jim. Chapter 11 Face to Face with the Champion Madison Square Garden, March 24, 1935 Jim Braddock and Joe Gould smiled for the cameras. Then it was time for the reporter's questions. Jim, do you have anything to say to our readers? Not everybody gets a second chance, answered Jim. He looked at May, who sat at the front in a new yellow dress, smiling nervously. I have a lot to be grateful for. A second reporter stood. Can you tell our readers why you gave your relief money back? Jim nodded. This great country of ours helps a man when he's in trouble. I've had some good luck. So I thought I'd return the money. Another reporter stood. Max Bear says that he's worried he's going to kill you in the ring. What do you say? May looked down at her hands. Jim looked the reporter in the eye. Max Bear is the champion, he said. I'm looking forward to the fight. The next question was from a familiar face. Sporty Lewis stood and turned toward May. Mrs. Braddock, how do you feel about the fact that Max Bear has killed two men in the ring? May could find no words. Mrs. Braddock, are you scared for your husband's life? Continued Lewis. A camera appeared in front of May's face. Jim jumped to his feet. She's scared for Max Bear. He shouted. Joe Gould lifted his arms like a referee. Okay, okay, one more question. While Jim answered the last question, his eyes searched for May. She refused to look up, not wanting him to see the doubts and fear in her eyes. When Jim Braddock and Joe Gould entered Madison Square Garden's boxing club, Jimmy Johnston was waiting for them. The rich, powerful businessman waved a newspaper at the fighter and his manager. It says here that this fight is as good as murder. Johnston said, stepping close up to Braddock. This is my business, and I'm going to protect myself. You will know exactly what Bear can do before you get in that ring. A door opened and a small man in a suit entered the room. This was Johnston's lawyer, and he was followed by a secretary. Johnston went to a machine and began to show a film. It showed two boxers getting ready to fight. One was Max Bear. Johnston said the other man's name. That's Frankie Campbell. A good fighter who knows how to take a punch. The fight began. Johnston turned to Braddock. Is Campbell's style familiar? Jim? It's like looking in a mirror, isn't it? He doesn't need to see this, complained Joe. He'll see it or there will be no fight. Johnston warned. On the film. Campbell stepped forward with a good left jab. Almost as good as Jim's. Bear blocked it easily, then hit back with his right. The punch was too fast to see, A, and D it had a strange, terrible power. Campbell just stood there in confusion, with his gloves down by his side. The second punch hit the side of his head. And then Campbell was down. His legs wide, his eyes open but seeing nothing. It was the second punch that killed him, said Johnston. You've warned us, said Joe. Now stop the film. No, said Jim, surprising both Joe and Johnston. Show it again. When the lights were back on, Johnston stared at Jim. Remember Ernie Schaff? He was a good fighter. Ernie took one of Bear's punches on the chin. He was dead and didn't know it. In his next fight, the first jab killed him. He sat back in his chair. Do you want to think about this fight? Jim hit his hands on the desk angrily. Do you think you're telling me something I don't know? He shouted. How many guys died because they didn't have enough food? 
or because they had to work long hours and dangerous jobs to feed their families? I've thought about it as much as I'm going to. Okay, then. Johnston looked away. Why don't you both eat here tonight with your wives? The fight organizer smiled. But there was something about the look in his eyes that Jim didn't trust. Later that day, the two men returned to the club's restaurant with their wives. The four ate, talked, and laughed, as a piano played quietly in the corner. After the meal, Joe pulled a newspaper out of his pocket. He turned to the sports pages. And began to read. Jim Braddock is back from the dead to give hope to every American. Jim was surprised. Who wrote that? Sporty Lewis. The newspaper is calling you the Cinderella Man. Cinderella Man? Jim didn't look happy. Cinderella was a children's story. Wasn't Cinderella the girl who had to stay at home? And clean while her sisters went to a wonderful party at the palace? I like it, said May, squeezing his hand. Suddenly, an enormous man with two young women on his arms walked in through the front door. Conversations died around the room. The man had thick black hair and the brightest blue eyes. He was wearing an expensive white jacket. But he looked dangerous. As usual, all eyes in the room turned to him. This was Max Bear. Jim turned to his manager. Do you think Johnston planned this? He asked angrily. Joe nodded. Sure. More pictures for the papers. Physically, Bear was the perfect boxer. He had a narrow waist, wide shoulders, strong legs. And long arms. He was young, two at twenty-six, three years younger than Jim. And he had the strongest punch Joe Gould had ever seen probably the strongest punch in the history of boxing. Joe knew that there were ways to beat the champion. His right hand punch was so powerful that he hadn't really worked on improving his left hand. But Joe couldn't forget the sight of Bear destroying Primo Camera. The big Italian had been knocked down eleven times in that fight. Joe's attention moved away from Bear when a waiter arrived with a bottle of wine and four glasses. From the gentleman at the bar. Mr. Bear said I should wish you good luck. Jim looked at May. The blood had run from her face, leaving her pale with worry. He stood. Get the coats, Joe. Then he began walking toward the bar. Bear gave a big smile when he saw Jim coming. Look, it's the Cinderella man. He shouted. Jim stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the champion. You keep saying in the newspapers that you're going to kill me in the ring. I have three little kids. You're upsetting my family. Bear moved closer. His voice was quiet as he said. Listen to me, Braddock. I'm asking you not to take this fight. People admire you. You seem like a nice guy. And I don't want to hurt you. It's no joke. They're calling you the Cinderella Man. Well, people die in children's stories all the time. Suddenly, a small crowd of reporters and photographers ran into the club. Bear turned to face the cameras and smiled. His voice was loud again as he started performing for the cameras. If you're smart, you'll fall over in the first round, he told Jim. Jim's eyes met Bear's. I think I'll try for a few rounds, he said. Bear noticed. May, standing behind Jim now. You should talk to him, he said. You're much too pretty to lose your husband. Jim squeezed his fist into a ball, ready to attack. But Bear continued to look at May. Maybe I can take care of you after he's gone. This time Joe Gould jumped, waving his fists at the champion. Jim pulled him back. May stepped up to the bar. Bear's bright blue eyes followed her as she picked up his drink then threw it in his face. Bear just laughed as he dried his face. Did you get that, boys? He said to the reporters. Braddock has his wife fighting for him. Jim stepped up to Max Bear. The two boxers were nose to nose. Then Jim turned, took his wife's hand. And led her away. As they left, the sound of Bear laughing followed them into the street. Chapter 12. The Big Day. Keep your head down and give me a combination left, right, left. Jim was teaching. Jay and Howard how to box. Jay threw out a right fist and lifted his chin. Jim reached forward and gently hit his son's chin. Don't take your eyes off your opponent, he said. That's enough, now, said May from the kitchen sink. Jim looked at his boys proudly. There's more than one fighter in the Braddock family. As the two boys continued to box, they knocked over a chair. May turned. I said that's enough. She cried. No boxing in the house. She pointed at her two sons. You are going to stay in school. Then college. 
You are going to have professions. You are not going to have your heads broken in the boxing ring. Is that clear? The boys froze. Before they could reply, May ran out of the apartment. As she stood outside, she could still hear Sporty Lewis's words in her head. Max Bear has killed two men in the ring. She didn't turn when she heard Jim's steps. When you boxed before, sometimes I hoped that you would get hurt. Just enough so you couldn't fight again. I always knew a day would come when a fight could kill you. And now it's here. She looked her husband in the eye. Why? Why fight him? This is what I know how to do, said Jim simply. May waited for Jim to take her in his arms, to say that he had changed his mind. But he didn't. Part of him wished that he could, but it was impossible. She didn't understand how it felt for men like Jim or Mike Wilson Strong, hard-working men who were told that they were useless. There were thousands of people like this now. And they found hope in the fighter they called the Cinderella Man. Jim had to fight, for them. May's fear turned to anger. I supported you until now, she said. But not for this, Jim. I just can't. Her voice went cold. You find a way out of this fight. Break your hand again, if you have to. But if you leave this apartment to fight Max Bear, I won't support you. As the day of the fight grew closer, Max Bear helped reporters fill their sports pages. His latest demand was that there must be an ambulance outside Madison Square Garden, ready to rush Jim to a local hospital after Bear hit him. Jim just continued training. Joe Jeanette chose good partners for him to work with in the ring. Each one helped Jim improve one skill one partner helped him work on his hand speed. Another partner allowed him to practice dodging big punches, another helped him move around the ring quickly. Jim, Joe. And Jeanette also watched film of Bear's fights for hours every day. Watch him, said Jeanette, pointing. His punches are strong, but you can see them coming. With just a few weeks to go, Braddock's training became even harder. Joe and Jeanette started changing his boxing partners more and more often. So Jim fought a fresh fighter every round. One of the newspaper sports pages included something that Joe had said, Braddock is going to be really prepared for this fight, if he lives through training. Joe laughed when he read that, until his wife reminded him that. May Braddock would read it, too. Finally, the big day arrived. When Joe Gould arrived at the gym that morning. Jim was sitting alone, with a jacket tight around his chest. What's wrong with him? The manager asked Joe Jeanette. Jeanette shook his head. He's fitter than ever. But he's old. His ribs aren't strong since the Lasky fight. Gould already knew about the problem with Jim's ribs. But he thought there was something else wrong. Gould knew that Jim's wife wasn't happy about his profession. And about this fight especially. But whatever the problem was, there was no time to solve it now. The fight was just hours away. The reporters will be here soon, he told Jim. Take off that jacket or bear will see that you have a rib problem. Jim climbed into the training ring as a crowd of sports writers rushed into the room. He worked hard, but he still wanted to train more after the last reporter had gone. Joe Jeanette refused. Go home and get some rest. You'll be working hard enough in the ring tonight. So Jim went home. He returned to a house that was empty except for May. She stood silently, looking at the newspaper. World champion fight tonight many worry for Braddock's life. Without a word, she turned and walked away. As the morning became afternoon, Jim lay in bed, unable to sleep. A taxi came for him at four o'clock. May followed Jim outside where a small crowd of neighbors was waiting, come home with that title. Knock him out. Jim kissed his three children. Then his eyes met May's. I can't win if you don't support me, he said. Then don't go, Jimmy. Time seemed to stretch, with each of them waiting for the other to say something. Then May turned and pulled the children close to her. Jim watched as she pushed her way back through the crowd. Then he climbed into the waiting taxi. The taxi drove past the tall buildings of Manhattan. Then crossed the East River. Jim was silent, running the films of Bear's fights through his head, remembering Jeanette's advice anything to help him forget the look on May's face as he left. They reached the Madison Square Garden Bowl and Jim looked out at the waiting crowd. He could see that these people had known hard times. But there was something else, too, a bright look in their eyes hope. Jim saw his own face in the glass of the car window. He had beaten Tuffy Griffith so confidently. But that man was gone forever. He had passed his hat hopelessly around the boxing club. But that man, was gone, too. No, 
He was looking now at the face of every man who had ever been beaten down by hard times but refused to stop fighting. That's when Jim knew. No matter what happened tonight, he wouldn't give up. He would die trying. It was a hot day and getting hotter. Jim sat in his dressing room waiting to go out and be weighed. Come on, champion, said Joe Gould when there was a knock on the door. Wait a minute, said Jim. The last time I looked, I was the challenger, not the champion. I know what I said, replied Joe. On his way to the weighing room, Max Bear had seen an old trainer who had worked with him years before. There were angry words and Bear hit out at the man. Cameras recorded the attack. When there was peace in the room again. Officials and reporters watched the two boxers being weighed. It was very hot in the crowded room. Max Bear went first, stepping up with his fists above his head and an ugly smile on his face. 95 and a half kilograms, the judge announced. Then it was Jim's turn. 86 and a half kilograms. Max Bear was waiting for him when he stepped down. How does the story go? Said Bear, loud enough for all the reporters to hear. The clock strikes midnight. And then Cinderella loses her skirt. People laughed and more photos were taken. But Jim didn't care. He would have the chance to reply later, in the ring. He went back to his dressing room to get ready for the fight. Max Bear returned to his dressing room. His trainer was waiting with something for the champion to watch a film of Braddock's fight against Art Lasky. Look, right there. Said the trainer. As Lasky hit Braddock in the ribs, clearly hurting him. Braddock's ribs are weak. If you can hit them with a few good jabs, you'll really hurt him. I don't need to, answered Bear. I can knock this loser down any time. I just need to give the crowd a good show before I kill him. Bear's manager. Ansel Hoffman, came into the room. Did you get it? Asked the champion. Hoffman nodded. The ambulance is waiting outside. There's a doctor there, too. Max looked in the mirror. That's all I can do for him. Now Braddock's soon his own. May spent the rest of the day at her sister's house. As the children played, she and Alice sat and talked. But they didn't discuss the real reason for May's visit. As the afternoon shadows grew longer, May became quieter. At five o'clock, she stood. No radio, Alice, she said. I'll be back soon. May walked through the empty streets of Newark until she came to the family's church. Father Rorick stood at the door. There were crowds inside. Father? May asked confused by the crowd. I came to say a few words in church for Jim. All these people are doing the same, said the priest. They think Jim's fighting for them. May looked at the crowd again. All of these people were beaten down by hard times. They admired her husband. If he could fight and win, maybe they could. Yes. I understand now, said May. She turned and hurried down the street. She could hear radios through open windows and doors. Everybody was getting ready to listen to the fight at the docks, in homes and bars, in Sam the Butchers. Beyond Newark, too, across the country people wanted the Cinderella man to win. They wanted him to become the prince, the king, the champion. Joe Gould was taping Jim's hands in the dressing room. They could hear the sound of the crowd beyond. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door and a small, familiar shape stood there it was May. Excuse me for a minute, said Joe. He left, closing the door behind him. Finally, May spoke. You can't win if I don't support you. I keep telling you that, said Jim. May handed him a brown paper bag. I thought it was going to rain, so I used the money in the rainy day jar. Jim opened the bag and stared at the new pair of boxing shoes inside. Maybe I understand. May's eyes shone. The two kissed and, smiling through her tears, May said, I always support you, Jimmy. Just you remember who you are. You're everybody's hope and your kid's hero and you're the champion of my heart, James J. Braddock. It was almost fight time. See you at home, okay? May whispered, as she moved to the door. Please, Jimmy. Jim nodded. See you at home. 